God is good, and I'm very thankful, yes, for our fathers. They are the strength of the backbone there, of the family there. <laughs> and we praise the Lord for the fathers. And God bless each and every one. Praise the Lord. All right. God is good. And we're going to talk today. I thought the first song we sung this morning was so perfect <laughs> for the message today. I mean, it just this right in. So, <laughs> hallelujah, we're going to sing all about it. <laughs> Hallelujah, we're going to shout all about it. Praise God. All right, we're going to go to the book of Joshua. We were in Joshua last time I ministered. Um, Joshua chapter 3 to be exact. We talked about Israel crossing over Jordan, crossing over death and death unto life. That's when we know that they came into the promised land. All right, and then um, you can read in chapter 4 where they began to uh, set up the stone monument when they would take the stones as they came up out of Jordan, and they would, they made a monument um, in order to remind them, in order for it to be generations down the road, that they could see this memorial and remember what God did for them. Amen? Um, so I'm going to start today in Joshua chapter 5. This is um, titled Circumcision and Passover at Gilgal in my Bible here. It's not the title of my message, but Circumcision and Passover at Gilgal. And he says in verse 1, And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. So what do we find out right off that first thing? We find out that they were afraid of Israel. They were afraid of this group of people. They were afraid because they had seen what their God could do. Amen. They knew, they had heard the reports, and they knew that these people were come to take their land. Quite a different report than what we find out that the Israelites thought of themselves 40 years ago, right? <laughs> they were as grasshoppers, but we find that the enemy knows, amen. They, they, they know that they have come to take the land, and they were fearful. They were afraid. And it says in verse 2, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now we know that circumcision is a sign of the covenant. Okay? For the 40 years they've wandered in the desert. In the wilderness, we find that they had not continued or kept that circumcision. Okay? Because as, as we read on down here, they had not kept that going. Um, they had kind of become lacked on that area. But we're going to find here that he's going to renew. He's going to show them a renewal of that covenant, that covenant of peace, that covenant of, of life, that covenant of joy and rejoicing, that covenant that I am your God and you are my people, that covenant where he says, I'm going to go before you, okay, and I am going to possess the land to get to you. I'm going to take the land. I'm going to destroy the giants ahead of you. And we see that in verse 1. They're already fearful and afraid. Amen. So here we go. He says, make knives, sharp knives, okay? And Joshua made him sharp knives. Now, when we, we think about the knives, the, how many know the word of God, it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder of even the soul and spirit. We know that the sword, this two-edged sword, is for cutting away the flesh, amen? But it's also for healing, Amen? This sword, with this word of God here, cuts away at our flesh, doesn't it? It cuts away everything that's not like God himself. Amen? Cuts away everything that would keep us separated from him. And it heals our heart, our relationship with him. So we find here, talking about this sword, cutting away this flesh, and he says, he made him a sharp knife, and he circumcised the children of Israel, all right, at the hill of the foreskins, okay? Now, the foreskins speaks of insensibility. It speaks of uncleanness, okay? Um, it speaks of unclean fruit. How many know they were, um, that speaks of, basically, they were bringing forth their own 
ideals, amen, their own thoughts. They, were, they had not been um, kept reminded of the covenant, the relationship, amen. We have to, now we have to be circumcised, brought back under that relationship, okay. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. So we see here, all right, they, they did not continue with the circumcision. All those that had come out of Egypt that had been circumcised died in the wilderness, all right? Um, so we find here, now he's going to do this. It's a reminder there again, like I say, that of the covenant that I'm your God. Because, have you know, in the next chapter, they're going to go into Jericho. And they're going to take Jericho, all right? So we have to know our God, and we have to know who he is. I mean, we have to know our relationship with him. And he says, so now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, all right, that's key, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, all right, because they obeyed, this is why, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land, all right. Let's go ahead and get this on here. Because they had, which the Lord sware to the fathers, that he would give us a land that flows with milk and honey. Now this milk and honey, how many know, that speaks of a land, amen, without boundaries. It speaks of a, a, a beautiful, prosperous, healthy, strong, a land that flows. It, it just flows. There's no force. There's no hardships, no hardness. Amen. It just flows. It flows with the very best. Amen. That milk and that honey speaks of the very best. Amen. This is what this land flowed through. And we saw the type and shadow of all these things whenever they went in the land the first time. We, we find that when they came out, that what they were carrying between two men, one cluster of grapes. Tell me that's not a prosperous, blessed place, right? <laughs> so we find here, this is speaking of the, the prosperity and the blessings. It speaks of, of, of the very, very rest. Amen? Um, so when we look at these things, and we look at the cutting away of the foreskin, we look at the, the renewal of this relationship. Amen? We can remember out that back in Romans, he tells us, because uh, I want to be sure we understand what I'm talking about. When we look at the book of Romans, he tells us, Romans chapter 7, he says that that old man is dead. Didn't he? He tells us that old man's dead. And he says, now we have a right to bring forth fruit unto God. So we see how that that um, uncleanness, that, that foreskin speaks of the unclean fruit that's brought forth. But now in Romans chapter 7, also we find he talks about that that old man is dead. And he's wanting us to bring forth the fruit unto godliness, unto God. Amen. Uh, Romans chapter 5, he talks about bringing us into the fruit of holiness. He says, because you're not under sin anymore. You're not bound by that sin. No longer are you. Well, let's just read it. I'll hold your place right here because I, I want to put this right here. We're going to read. Because I want us to get the idea of what we're talking about. I want us to see how many of them, because we, this old has to tie with the new. It has to match. It has to fit. And so when we read in Romans chapter 5, let's just go to Romans chapter 6. Because Romans chapter 5 is good too. But Romans chapter 6 basically is where I want to be. He says, we were buried with him by baptism unto death. In verse 4. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. We are now a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. All right. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. I want to read on down. Let's go on down. Well, let's read it right quick. Knowing that Christ, verse 9, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died into sin once. But then he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon or count yourself also to be dead indeed unto sin. 
but alive unto God. See, this all is representative of that cutting away of the foreskin. Reckon yourselves to be dead. Let's cut this all off, this, this, all this fleshly stuff, and bring forth the fruit unto God. He says in verse 12, Let not sin, therefore, uh, reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. All right? He says in verse 14, Sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. He says in verse 22, But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So when we are looking at this cutting away of the foreskin, we're looking at this covenant of God where he says it's a covenant of life. It's a covenant where I promise to be your God. I promise to provide everything that you need. I promise to be your shield and your buckler, the horn of your salvation. I promise to take care of you and no matter what. I promise to go before you to destroy the enemy. I promise to give you every bit of the land that you choose to believe. I promise that it's all your inheritance to have. What do we have to do? Believe. For everywhere that you choose to believe, Wherever you choose to place the sole of your foot, that's yours to have. You can have it, but you've got to believe it. Amen? So I just want to show you how all this connects. You can read on down into chapter 7 where, then, where we were talking about um, that old man is dead. He's dead, been buried, placed in the ground. He's no longer to be reckoned with him because Jesus Christ already took care of it. So all these things we can connect with the foreskin with this covenant that he's talking about. We find that um, those that were circumcised in Egypt that came out, that were men of war. We, I'm going back to Joshua chapter 5. These all died in the wilderness because what? They did not obey. They did not believe. They did not believe that their God had already went before them. Remember their testimony. What did they say? We are as grasshoppers. Hey, there's giants in the land. And we cannot defeat these enemies. We can't come overcome them. But God says, I've already done it. Amen? So we see here, they, they all died in the wilderness. But we're taking now, we're taking this younger generation, 40 years later, and we're going to circumcise them. We're going to remind them of this covenant of God. We're going to walk with, amen, and talk with them, the people. And we're going to take care of them. We're going to provide. We're going to give them the land. Amen? So he says, it's a land. He says in verse 6, Joshua 5 and 6, he, sa he says, I, I would not, I sh he said, unto whom the Lord swear that these that didn't obey, that they should, would not see the land, okay, which the Lord swear unto their fathers, that he would give us. It's a land that floweth, it, it flows, it flows, it's not hard, it's not uh, a struggle, amen. How many know it was a struggle whenever sin was instituted in Adam, Remember? If you're going to work by the sweat of your brow and it's going to be laborious and it's going to be hard and there's, it's going to be lack and drought and need and all these weeds to pull, amen, and to struggle, it's going to be a struggle. But now I'm bringing you in to this land that simply flows. It flows with all the goodness of God. It flows with the very living life of the living God. It's the promised land, amen. And so it, this is the, if I can just get it, it's the very best of the best. It's the top of the line. Amen. And he promised it to us. And it just simply flows to us. Amen. And we flow in this, amen, river of life. Praise God. We could go on to a lot of things, but I'm not going. He says, and their children, whom he raised up in their steed. Then Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. Okay, and it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. All right, till they were whole. All right, uh, in John, let's just read John chapter 7. I'm going to go over there, John chapter 7. I can say back and forth, but I want you to see how this Bible has to work together. One God inspired one god amen and it has to work together uh in john chapter 7 we find jesus is at the feast of tabernacles and we know tabernacle speaks of the seventh day and all we can go into a lot of things there um let's see where i want to start 
Facebook.com. If any man will do his will, uh, he says in verse 16, Jesus answered them, he said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh himself speaketh of his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go you about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast the devil. Who goeth about to kill you? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And you on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Now, there, at this point, there, he's done something, amen, that on the Sabbath day, we find he does several things on the Sabbath day, and they continually, you know, put him down. They continually criticize. They continually do these things because, oh, you know, it's the Sabbath day, and you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath day. He said, but you circumcise a man on the Sabbath day. And if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me? Because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. Oh, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. I have made a man every whit whole on the sabbath day all right I, and you could kind of it kind of translates out as i have made a well man whole in other words he's made a i, I believe he's the man with the withered hand we could read on up there and see but we find that he's made a man whole on the sabbath day what day are we we're in the sabbath day basically aren't we seventh seventh we looked at the circles and we did all those things uh, we're and coming into the eighth, we're also, it overlaps, we're in, coming into that eighth day. But I want you to see this. I'm going back to Joshua chapter 5. All right. So he made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. So we're looking here in Joshua 5 and 8. And he says, you've come into, you've crossed Jordan. Okay. In chapter 3, you've crossed Jordan. You've crossed from death unto life. Amen. So you are now in the promised land. All right, but you've not yet taken Jericho, okay, because that's in the next chapter. But I want you to know you've already crossed from death to life. You're already in the promised land. God's renewing and showing you his covenant, amen, so that you can now go and take this land, all right, take your possession, because I mean, you know Jericho speaks of his scent. His essence, man's essence. How many know that's a huge enemy? <laughs> because how many well, we're used to doing things our own way, aren't we? <laughs> we're used to, and this is the way the world does it. So it's easy to fit in with the world. It's easy to fit in with what's easy, amen, to just be like the world, isn't it? To just do whatever feels right or seems right to ourselves. But God says, wait a minute, um... We're supposed to believe in him. We're supposed to follow him. This, what, the ones that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Amen? So it, it's, he's, he's saying there is a, a battle, but how many know the battle is the Lord's? Amen? <laughs> and we find that when we read over here with Jericho. Amen? It's yielding. It's believing what he's done. Amen? Believing what he's done. All right, and we're going to get to that here on down here, we're going to look. Let's just let's go on before I get too far ahead of myself here. Because there's so many good things here. Um, he says, so they abode in this place till they were whole. Okay. Um, he, he goes on, he says, and the Lord said unto Joshua, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Woo! Gilgal means rolling as a wheel. Okay? It means the revelation of God. Let's, I, I looked it up to get a little bit more on it. I rolled away. In this particular part is 1556. All right? 
means to whirl, to roll, to turn, to drive away, to be rolled together, to roll oneself upon, to be rolled in blood, in parentheses, in blood, speaks the atonement. The picture is rolling one's self upon the Lord, trusting in the Lord. You could look in Psalm 28, uh, 22 and 8. It's committing one's life to the Lord, Psalm 37, 5, Proverbs 16, 3, or removing contempt, all right? He removed the content, a contempt, amen? He rolled away the condemnation. Here in Gilgal, we find this is what we're seeing. This is our type and shadow of what he did in the New Testament. Amen. He said, the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. We could tie it with Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. I rolled away the reproach. I've rolled away the condemnation. I've rolled these things away. Um, turn with me. Let's look in Matthew. We're going to come back here. Just hang on for this. Let me put that there. So Matthew 28. And let's just look at a few things right here. I want you to see. Matthew 28. Because, you know, he tells us, be ye holy, even as I am holy. Doesn't he? How can we be holy if, he, if we still have reproach, if we still have condemnation? How can we attain unto what he's already done and called us to be? Matthew 28, he says, in the end of the Sabbath, as he began to draw toward the first day of the week. Now, this is after he was crucified, put in the grave. Came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, and what did he do? He rolled back the stone from off the door, and he sat upon it. See, there was a rolling away. That, that body of flesh, Jesus took every sin and every sickness. He took that that all upon himself, that condemnation he took upon himself, amen, upon that literal physical body that he had, and it was placed in the grave, and there was a stone rolled over. But he tells us, amen, that the stone was rolled away, and in rolling away the stone, then he could rise up from that grave, released from the penalty of that sin, released from that penalty of condemnation. Amen. Now, when, and just as we read in Romans chapter 6, he rose, amen, victorious over that condemnation, victorious over death, victorious over every enemy, every giant that was in the land, every sickness, amen, those are all giants, all the ites, amen, he rose victorious over those things when that stone was rolled away, he was able to rise up victorious over those things, and Romans chapter 6 just told us that when he rose, now we can be as he is, now we can live in the same newness of life that he is because the stone's already been rolled away. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah! And that's the title of my message today. The stone has been rolled away. It has already been rolled away. Amen? And so there is therefore, now we can talk about Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now, 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 no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? 
He already took it, put it in the grave, and left it there, rose up victorious without all that junk. Amen? And now we are called to live in that same newness of life that he lived in, that he lives in. Let me correct my English there. That he actually lives in. Amen? And just as it said in Romans chapter 6, there's therefore now no more sin. Sin doesn't have any dominion over us anymore. And sin, the wages of sin is death. And so if that's already been taken care of, then, amen, death has already been arrested. Death has already been taken care of. There's no more death. Amen? amen. And we find in Timothy, he says he's already taken away that condemning power of death. All right? He says now we can live in the same life that he lives in. That What kind of life does he live in? Resurrection life. I am the resurrection and the life. The life that's in us is the life of the resurrected king, Jesus Christ. Amen. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, what does it do? It quickens and makes alive these mortal bodies. Amen? That's what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen? And that's part of that cutting away of that flesh. It's a coming into a quickening or the life. Amen? Because no longer under that old law of sin and death. Now he's raised us up and placed us under a higher law. A law of life, life, life in Christ Jesus. The resurrected life of the living king. Amen. Woo! He rolled away the stone. Amen. It's been rolled away. And I believe there is no more condemnation. Amen. We've been justified. When we read back in Romans chapter 5, we find that we have been justified. Amen. And it's by faith that we receive the justification. Amen. So I'm going back to Joshua. God is so good. Amen. He's so good. And if we could just understand what all he's already done. He says, the Lord said unto Joshua this day, this day have I rolled away the stone. You can go to, let's go to Mark. Let's, let's go to Mark. Mark talks about it also, because Mark's got a very good, interesting comment along with what he said about it. Let's just go back there while we're here. Oh, Mark went too far. Mark, Mark. Mark, chapter 16. Oop, too far. Mark, chapter 16. All right. Let's see. <laughs> okay, I want to go back. Uh, let's see, Mark 16. He's risen. Oh, here it is. Mark 16, and verse 4. Let's see. Uh, let's look at verse 1. And when the Sabbath was uh, passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. That's... We could preach a message on that one too. But he said, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? So they're already contemplating. How are we going to do this? All right. By man's strength. But guess what? When they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away. It was already rolled away. Man hadn't ha didn't have to do it here. It was already rolled away. And he says, For it was very great. It was very great. That condemnation, that sin issue, amen, was very great. It was a hard, great, it was a great giant thing. We couldn't overcome it, amen. It was big, amen. And man could not roll it away, amen. Man could not take care of that. It had to be Jesus Christ, amen. All right, praise the Lord. Um, let's go back here. So the reproach they took care of. Uh, the contempt, the shame, uh, all these things were taken care of as he rolled back in Gilgal, back in Joshua. We find that he took care, he took care of this. Amen? Um, so let's go on and look down here in Joshua chapter 5, back where we were at. Uh, wherefore the name of that place is called Gilgal. And there's sh when you run across the word Gilgal, in your Bible, read it very carefully. We can go back to Elijah and Gilgal when he was taken up into heaven and that's another whole message in itself. But when you find the word Gilgal in your Bible, you're going to understand that it means rolling as a wheel or the revelation of God, bringing 
you back into, amen, that uh, relationship, that atonement, that oneness with God, amen. So we find here uh, in verse 10, Joshua 5 and 10, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day. And the manna ceased. Verse 12. The manna ceased. How many know it was the bread from the wilderness? Amen. We know it was called angel's food, but we know that if that was what they were consisting of, living off of in the old Amen. In the desert, in the wilderness. So we see here the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more. But what happened? But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. They did eat of the fruit. This is a tremendous statement because here we see that no longer are they eating of the old. Amen? That old man is dead. Behold, we are now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And behold, the old has passed away. And all things are made new. See how this, how this works? All things are made new. So we are no longer to partake of that old man. Act like that old man. Think like that old man. Amen? Our our the things that we're supposed to do is to line up with the new. Amen. Amen. Line up with who Christ Jesus is. And as we understand that that old thing's all been done away with. That old law's been fulfilled. It's been completed. We don't owe anything to it according to Romans chapter 8. We don't owe anything to that old law. To that old man. He's gone. He's dead. We are now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And behold, now we are to bring forth the fruit of godliness, to bring forth fruit unto God, as we find in Romans chapter 7. Amen. Bring forth fruit unto holiness. Amen. We read in chapter 5, I believe it was. We find here that he's calling us now to be as he is you know what it tells, tells us to do? As he is in this earth, aren't we to be the same thing? We're to be one with him. Jesus prayed, remember? He said, you know, um, I and my Father are one. And then he goes on and he says, Father, make them one even as we are one. Amen? Amen? How do we do that? We, get, we quit thinking and acting as the old man would act and think. And line our thoughts and our actions up with righteousness, with godliness. Because we recognize that that stone, hey, that stone has been rolled away. Hallelujah. Amen. And all that thing, all that old junk is old junk. And it's no longer a part of who, what, what we are. Amen. Romans chapter 12 tells us, amen, that we are now... To not think and act like the old, like the old world, amen. Because we've become that sacrifice, we can become that living sacrifice, which is acceptable unto God. And He says, "Don't think or act like the world anymore. Don't be conformed to the world, but be ye conformed or made un like a new creature. That new creature, and we're to. It's like a renovating, amen. Getting rid of that old stuff, pull all the stuff out of the closet and throw it away, amen." This is the house of the living God now. Amen. And we've hung on to some old stuff. <laughs> we've hung on to that old man's stuff for too long. Amen. And we've got to clean it out. And why do we, how do we do that? We do that by, wash me by the water of your word. Cleanse my heart, for I love you, Lord. I lift my hands in worship unto thee. Blinded eyes are open now to see. How do we know? We understand because what do we, got? We, we, we have to see what he's done. 
We could read Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He'd, all, all these things he took. Amen? He already did. And that was put in the grave. Amen? And I cannot stress how, how much that he's taken care of all that stuff. It's already gone. It's already taken care of. Amen? Amen. We are new creatures. And as we read this, we find um, down here in the notes of my Bible, it says, after crossing the Jordan, Israel camped at Gilgal for a while before the conquest of Canaan began. Several things happened at Gilgal which signified that the wilderness wandering was over and that Israel was embarking on a new phase of their natural history, national history. First of all, Joshua had the people and uh, up to, uh, pick up the stones in verse chapter 4 and make a monument to the miraculous drying up of the Jordan for the crossing. Uh, next, the young males were circumcised, which re, uh, reinstitutes a practice that had not been kept for nearly 40 years. And with that accomplished, they could uh, uh, then observe the Passover. And finally, and probably the most indicative uh, of uh, the end of their wanderings was the day that after the Passover, the manna stopped and they ate from the produce of Canaan. They're eating of the fruit of the promised land. All right? We can partake of the fruit of the Canaan at any moment when we choose to of that promised land. He says, I've put a table before you. I've placed everything on that table that you need. We could, I'm paraphrasing, because we, we find in Peter, Second Peter, he's already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. See, I've set a table before you, and it's yours to take any time. You can choose to take the steps in this land any time. You can choose to be healed in every area. And we, it's all about believing, amen? And it's according to knowledge, is what he tells us in Peter. When we read it, he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, but it's through the knowledge. So there again, reading the word, reading the word, conversing with one another about the word and, you know, experiences that we've had in the Lord, amen? And it all builds us up. So he says, they partook of the fruit of Canaan, of the promised land. We can partake of the promised land right now. It's believing that we can. That's what the problem is, really believing that we can. Because how many know, when we look at, when we go about our natural day, our everyday normal day, all we see about us is people that are in lack and need and there's shortcomings, and there's problems, and, and we might do something that we think, well, why did I do that? You know, we, there's things, it all looks like limitations. But we have to learn to think in terms of no limitations, because God is not limited. God is unlimited. His, so his, his, his essence, his spirit, who and what he is, is unlimited. Amen. And if he's that essence or that life, spirit that's within us, then what are we? <laughs> the only limitations is what we have right here. We believe that we can only do so much. We believe that we can only have so much. We believe that we can only be so, just, you know, a little bit prosperous or a little bit, because, you know, it's, it's vanity. You know, if we, if we really think we're prosperous, I mean, we might, it, it's, it, it can be a bad thing, right? Because we've been taught that, you know, to be humble and to be subservient and all these things. But he says we're to be blessed. And in being blessed, then what do we do? We bless others. <laughs> See, that's the key. We've got to quit thinking in terms of that we're uh, being, you know, uh, wrong by thinking blessings. You know what I'm saying? So he says, I'm getting off track here. We're getting so many things here. And he says, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, verse 13, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he did worship, and he said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. 
Joshua did so. Okay? This just talks about what we've just talked about back in Romans. That we already are holiness unto the Lord. He cannot live in an unclean temple. We are already holy. Alrighty? We are already righteous. Not because of anything we've done, but because of the sacrifices Jesus made. We're already holy. This is the temple of the holy, the living God. Amen? Amen? And we could go, there's thinking of all kinds of scriptures. We could go back to where Peter's on the rooftop and the she comes down. And he says, don't call what I have clean, unclean. It's already clean. It's already holy. Anyway, Jericho. We've talked about Jericho. Jericho, like I say, speaks of man's essence. Man's the scent of man. Amen? And so we find that having to, that just speaks basically of we've got to get rid of self <laughs> and recognize ourselves for who we are, who our true identity is. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the life of the living God. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you. He does. He does. He does. Amen. Praise God. So we know that Jericho straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. We know, um, we've talked, it's been a while, we've talked about how impossible Jericho looked to destroy. The walls were so many feet wide and so many feet tall. And I mean, it was just, they actually would run chariot races on these walls. They were so wide and so tall. And, you know, so it looked impossible. It looked very impossible to overcome Jericho. It looks impossible sometimes, amen, doesn't it, in our lives to overcome situations in our lives, doesn't it? But what did they do? We're not going to read it all because we're running out of time. But we know that when they come to Jericho, what did the Lord tell them? You're going to put the praisers first, and they're going to praise. And you're going to follow the praisers, and you're going to circle Jericho one time, a day. You're not going to say a word. You're just going to listen to the praisers. As they praise, you're going to hear the praises. You're going to hear the praises. And that's what you're going to hear. You're what you're going to feel. Amen. Of the praises. And you're going to do that once the first day. You're going to do it once the second day. We do it six days. We go around Jericho once a day. But on the seventh day, something different happens. On the seventh day, the seventh time around, seven times seven is 49. The 50th is right around the corner, isn't it? So we find the 49th, all right? We find that the walls implode. But what happens before they do that? What did, they had something they had to do, didn't they? They went around once. Listen to the praises. They went around twice. Listen to the praises. Went around three times. Listen to the praises. We did it six times. But on the seventh time around, what did they do? They shouted the victory. Amen. Hallelujah. They shouted the victory. I, I thought I could say that first song. We said, hallelujah. I'm going to sing all about it. Hallelujah. I'm going to shout all about it because it, I don't know. Praise God. Death has been defeated. Wasn't that part of the song? Hallelujah. That's how we can go into the New Testament where he says we already have the victory in Christ Jesus because the stone's been rolled away. And there's no more condemnation. He always, my God, always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus because how many know the stone's been rolled away? Woo! All right. Hallelujah. We can overcome Jericho. We can overcome all the things that tend to plague us in these physical bodies. And in our homes, in our situations, in our life, in our work jobs, everything. We can and we have the ability to overcome all the things that would try to hinder us, stop us in our tracks, get us off track. We have the ability. It's the coming into the knowledge, amen, that, hey, man, he's already taken care of it. He's already went into the land, amen. He's already come against and defeated every enemy. And he rolled back the stone and rose victorious over all those things. And hallelujah, 
I'm going to sing all about it. And hallelujah, I'm going to shout all about it. Because Jesus is my victory. Amen. I already have the victory in Christ Jesus. That's my hallelujah shout. Amen. And we can shout it loud, shout it from the rooftops. But hallelujah, God is good. He has already given us all things. All things. Amen. Amen. All things that pertain are connected to or united with life. Ooh. Ooh. The life of the living God. Amen. That's who and what he is. That's who and what we are. Not because of anything we've done, but because what he did. Amen. Because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whomsoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life in Christ Jesus. Amen. I want you to know we have the victory today in Christ Jesus. If we shout the victory, those walls have to come down. There's no doubt about it. Absolutely. goes with that song God gave me. Oh, yes, it does. Praise the Lord. Yes. Lord, I thank you for the victory in everything. The grave, it has no victory, and death, it has no sting. He's defeated every enemy, and this I see. Lord, I thank you for the victory in Christ my King. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to know you have the victory today in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes, praise the Lord. Pastor Jude, did you have a, have a comment there?